guys, it is your girl, Nadge. I'm so happy that you're here today. Please do me a favor and go ahead and click that like and subscribe button. It's the way that you can stay up to date with my channel. Uh, if you click the bell, you'll always know when I post a video and that way there's no guesswork in it. You know, you can always know when I'm, I'm posting a video and I'm so happy you're here. Let's get right into it. Yo, so I wanted to talk to you guys today about the study that I found basically <clears throat> it's from the journalists resource in their economics, education, race, and gender section. And it is entitled are smart people less racist new research. Now this article is from 2016, but I thought that it was very interesting. Um, and then there is another one called you don't have to be well educated to be an aversive racist, but it helps um aversive that is the first time i've heard that word what does that mean aversive causing strong dislike or disinclination so this study is from pubmed well it's actually published on pubmed but it is a study from uh toon coupons um so yes, you don't have to be well educated to be an aversive racist, but it helps. And this is from 2014. Now these studies are a bit older. <clears throat> and right now, I'm so sorry that I keep like clearing my throat, guys. I'm still I'm I'm COVID is over. We've done the test and we're negative, but <clears throat> it's like my little throat is like still recovering. Um basically, um I've posted my videos clearly giving my stance about Harry and Meghan, uh, the, the Sussexes, and how I feel like the UK media is just so wrong for what they've been doing. The tabloid media in the UK is rampant and out of control. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And the obsession with these people, you really, I just... I don't see how you cannot see that it's about race and it's about class and it's about xenophobia. Like, you, how, how <laughs> basically how? I, I could sit here and spout out so many statistics. I can give you all of the statistics around the hate campaign, the Twitter hate campaign, the smear campaign, um, lies that have been told about this couple in the media and people will still argue you down while at the same time saying this isn't about race <laughs> it's like it's like Harry said in the documentary if you don't understand by now I I cannot I cannot help you I, I cannot help you and <clears throat> you know these people they come into my channel and they comment this stuff this hateful stuff and, um, you know, when you look online at people being blatantly racist, when you look at the entirety of Donald Trump's presidency, how absolutely offensive he was, you know, basically, you see videos on TikTok of crazy bigots and rednecks in the US, at least. At least for me, as someone who really prides themselves on being an anti-racist, someone who really prides themselves on being inclusive and making, no, insisting that multiculturalism be a large part of my life, I often look at people who are racist, bigoted, xenophobic, sexist whatever it is and I really can't understand and I think that being an African-American race is one of the ones that I really just don't understand especially since at least my educational background has exposed me to so many people of different backgrounds you know from Asian to African to European I <laughs> I just don't understand it I don't understand it um, but something that I, I have picked my brain about is wondering if education is somehow related because one thing that I do notice when people come on my comments and talk about how 
Harry and Meghan are narcissists, that they betrayed the royal family, that she is controlling Harry and she is a whiny baby and a narcissist. All of this crazy stuff. Um, I notice a lot of typos and misspellings in the comments. And, um, you know, just generally when you go online or you see on TV people who are being bigoted, it j you can just tell oftentimes they really don't seem well educated. But I don't think that it's just limited to education. I also think that emotional intelligence comes into this. So maybe this is a <clears throat> an, an, an anthropological and sociological question of, does does education like an a formal academic education weigh into being racist or is it a combination of a formal academic education and just simple emotional intelligence i'm gonna read you basically the synopsis of these articles really quickly and you guys tell me what you think in the comments so the journalist resource are people are smart people less racist new research so this is from 2016 it says 2016 study published in social problems that investigates whether white people with higher cognitive abilities are more likely to support racial tolerance and racial equality and um and already this study is a little bit skewed because it looks like it does only observe quote unquote white people which you know, even that, that just seems so, uh, I mean, we talk in these terms of white and black today because that is the sort of landscape that society has built to, to basically chalk everything up to black and white. I usually don't like to necessarily speak in those terms. I like to speak more into origin, you know, like a cultural or ethnicity origin, but, um, you know, at the same time, you're forced to speak into these realities because that's the reality of the society that we live in. But um, going towards the, 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 the conclusion of the article, I'm going to read you what it says. So it says, the study is the first to estimate the impact of verbal ability, one dimension of intelligence on racial attitudes. But the author notes that the question of whether smart people are less racist does not have a simple answer. White people with lower verbal test scores, as well as high scoring white people who were born earlier in the 20th century, have expressed racial attitudes that are akin to old fashioned racism, Watt states. So essentially what's that saying, that what that's saying is that less educated people, people with less um, formal educational abilities, I guess we'll say, in terms of verbal test scores, which what does that verbal test scores mean? It could be many things, but you know, basically they're stating that it's lower. So these are the people who perform lower on the academic level, express racial attitudes that are more akin to old fashioned racism. So essentially it's, it's saying in this study that they did, which let's see how many people they um, examined because that also factors into this. So this was a total of 44,873 white survey participants. So it's not a massive scale, but at the same time, it's it's quite good to do like um, a fairly um, revealing study. Um, okay, so it goes on to say, while white people with higher abilities generally give more liberal responses about questions related to anti-black prejudice and support for racial equality, they do not necessarily demonstrate liberal attitudes when it comes to policies designed to remedy racial inequality. That right there says everything. As someone who basically is a centrist, and I guess if you wanted to slap a label on me, it would almost place me in libertarian sort of area if you're talking about American politics. But um, I just don't even want to say that I'm libertarian either. I'm a centrist, you know. Sometimes my political views align with the left and sometimes it even aligns with the right. It just depends. 
It depends on what um, resonates with me as a person. But um, this is basically saying that white people with higher academic abilities, a, a more robust, you know, formal education, they have liberal responses in terms of anti-black prejudice and support for racial equality, but they don't necessarily want the government or society to do the work that sort of remedies that inequality. So the article ends by stating that the results of the study, according to Watk, at the very least cast doubt on the argument that cognitive ability is inherently liberalizing. So I'm going to introduce a little theory of my own here at the end of this video. Um, I do think that educational or academic intelligence is related, but I also think that, well, I'll, I'll say intellectual, um, intellectual um, intelligence is related, but I'm also going to argue that emotional intelligence is related. And um, I think that being well-traveled plays into this. Now, let me kind of, let me, let me get to that one. So this other article says that um, people with higher, the other article from PubMed, uh, from Cuppins, and that's Cuppins with a K, um, says that people with higher levels of formal education report less prejudice in survey research. Okay, people with higher levels of formal education report less prejudice in survey research. Um, it goes on to say that we replicate, we, we, here we present novel evidence on the nature of educational differences and anti-black attitudes among whites. So again, this study also delved mostly just into quote unquote whites, which I've already explained how I feel like that's kind of problematic. I really wish that the, um, how do you call it? The sampling. Yeah, I really wish that the sampling population was extended past just um, quote unquote white people because there's this whole idea that white people are like the only people who can be racist. And it's so not true. All types of people can be racist. Um, okay, anyway, I digress. So the study goes on to say, here we present novel evidence on the nature of educational differences and anti-black attitudes among whites. We replicate the education effect on explicit self-report measures of anti-black attitudes, but we find that education is much less related to implicit measures of anti-black attitudes. So <laughs> often when I'm reading like scientific research, I'm like, I just read it very slowly. And I'm like, what the F does that mean? <laughs> And this is as someone talking to you who has done so many research studies in school, through my job, and um, whether it's marketing or demographics, science, psychology, there is an aspect to it that is just so wordy. And it's like, dude, what are you trying to say? <laughs> um, it says we replicate the education effect on explicit self-report measures. Okay. Okay, okay, so it's saying that they found that basically um, education was less related, a lot less related to implicit measures of anti-black attitudes. Now, I feel like that's also trying to tell us something else, almost like maybe more educated people are not necessarily posing, um, you know, Maybe they're not provoking the, the, the world or society with extremely implicit, extremely obvious and in subtle forms of racism. Um, again, this focus on anti-black, which I think is so important, but obviously there's so many other communities that face racism. Um, but um, it's basically saying that their educational background 
produces a less implicit or less um less strong a less a, a less um very um out outspoken outright you know in subtle form of racism so maybe that's arguably maybe that's also saying that you know people can be educated and be less racist but maybe they're a little bit more subtle with their racism and we know that especially in in um societies where class it, classism is such a ingrained part of their anatomy you know especially like constitutional monarchies or um fascist countries things like that um it's it's very clear that there is a hierarchy and sometimes it's like the little people it has been drilled so far into them the quote-unquote little people in these societies you know, it's been drilled so far into them that they never ever question their rank in society. They don't necessarily try to step outside of generational um, racism, generational uh, uneducation or miseducation. And it's not really questioned because it's like, that's how it's been forever and it doesn't change. So I also feel like you can get that a lot in some of the eastern our in the in the in the parts of the eastern world with our eastern sisters and brothers you know in sort of remote villages in parts of asia and um you know like there's often this idea that you know i was born into nothing i'm not going to be anything and it doesn't really matter because if i speak out against the powers that be, you know, I'm literally going to put myself in harm's way. I'm going to put myself in danger. And so um, in systems like that, it, it, it really makes sense that the sort of negativity, this hostility can breed a sense of bigotry. I mean, there's really no other way to say that. I mean, I feel like education weighs into it. I also feel like classism weighs into it. But let's keep going. So it says implicit measures differ from implicit measures in that they, I'm sorry, implicit measures differ from explicit measures and that they do not allow respondents to control the measurement outcome. They therefore measure more spontaneous aspects of attitudes. These results shed new light on intergroup attitudes of the higher educated. Oh, mm. Okay, so, okay, okay, okay. So this basically is saying that implicit measures of racism differ from the explicit measure of racism. And therefore, it is obviously related to these intergroup attitudes of the higher educated. Now, um, I without having have read this entire study, but just reading the abstract, I know that there's more to this. So I could... I could misinterpret this, and so don't take me on um, faith for this, but I do think that this is probably teetering on the this idea that, like, people who are really, really racist <laughs> and people who are not so, so racist, maybe a little bit, or maybe they're racist, but it's a little bit more subtle. Um, I think that there, I think the article is saying that, that, that is also related to intergroup attitudes or what it calls intergroup attitudes of the higher educated. So that right there says to me that just the perception, even like, not even like factual, um, you know, observation of what a person's, what one's educational credentials are. But just the perception of someone's education can weigh into prejudice. And um, I get that. I get that because people can often look at educated people, especially educated people of color or educated women in, in third world countries where, you know, the education of women has not been emphasized. People, especially looking back at that class system, looking back at that caste, that caste stuff, you know, we all know about the lepers of society. 
that stuff is deeply ingrained more than you think in 2023 because it comes from thousands and thousands of years before it comes from well i won't say thousands let's go ahead and say hundred <laughs> let's not try to skip and hop back to like you know <laughs> prehistoric times or anything like that but um let's just say for at least hundreds of years and very um class caste merited based systems we know that that's been ingrained for a very long time even in modern places like constitutional monarchies um, that have grown from these very old, archaic, traditional setups, but are living in a, in a modern post-racial divide world. Like, we know that. So even just a perception of someone, seeing someone who maybe they deem as, how do I want to say this? You can have a, a, a bigoted person who is uneducated, and they can see, uh, a very educated, well-spoken person who is from a similar socioeconomic background as themselves, meaning, you know, lower class or lower middle class or working class, and they can see that person being educated, they can see that people, that, that person renouncing racism, they can see that person working towards humanitarian causes, um, climate change. I'm going to do another video on climate change soon. Um, and they can just be like, very hostile towards that person just because you know not even knowing any of their academic credentials but just because of a inter what they call this intergroup perception of one's education so i think that there's definitely something in that what do you guys think in the comments let me know and let's just keep going these results shed new light on intergroup attitudes of the higher educated Higher educated people are more likely to be aversive racist, that is to score low on explicit but not implicit measures of prejudice. So it's almost like, because this, this study is from 2014. So the study from 2016 um, elaborates on this almost, since this is an older study and it mentions aversive racist too. This is This is probably something that's, highly emphasized within this sort of research study field and um if you guys like this if you guys like this sort of um panel discussion about prejudice about um scientific scientific studies uh psychological studies and things like that um i do really enjoy this stuff so i mean i'm not gonna say i live for it but um Psychology, my, my psychology course in, in university really was interesting to me. You know, I've had therapy in the past, especially sort of as a support as being a family member of someone with, you know, severe bipolar disorder. Um, yeah, I, I find this stuff pretty interesting. And I also really find the nature of prejudice interesting and the nature of, um, sort of injustice, I just feel like with all the, the racism, the climate change denial these days, you know, the far polarization of the extreme right and the extreme left, um, I look at it and I guess that, that, that part of my brain that has had psychology courses, that has had therapy, that has read a lot of scientific studies and, and stuff like that, it, it really makes me try to understand the puzzle pieces, like what's going on here? Um, why do people think that way? What was their motivation, etc.? So if you guys are interested in this, I know it's probably a bit bland and boring, but I really wouldn't mind um, doing more research and, and discussing theories and hypotheses with you because I feel like these discussions are so crucial to humanity like I'm a big jokester and I joke around a lot on this channel but there is also this part of me that is a little bit more serious not necessarily the natural that you guys always see on my videos um I can be a little bit of a bookworm and um I just I feel like so much of the problems that we deal with in the world today from poverty to hunger to prejudice to racism to sexism to climate um change I feel like so much of that can be addressed with just a teeny bit of one opening their mind and a little bit of, of us educating ourselves, you know? So I'm a big proponent of that. 
you guys, what do you think? Just let me know. If this is boring as heck, we leave it there and we walk away. <laughs> if you like it, we can do more of this. So, um, the article concludes to say, given the differential relation of explicit versus implicit measures to behavior, they have wide ranging implications for the kind of intergroup behavior and discrimination that we can express, expect less and more highly educated people. Oh, that last sentence has a typo. Mm. Okay, this this could be an article, maybe not um, published by a... This could be published by a non-English person. So let me... Okay, given the differential relation of explicit versus implicit measures to behavior, they have wide-ranging implications for co the kind of intergroup behavior and discrimination we expect from less and more highly educated people. Okay, so no, no, that's, that's not a typo. Basically, they're saying there's two scales almost. There's a scale of being implicitly prejudiced and explicitly prejudiced. And there's a scale of being highly educated and less educated. And so they're basically just saying in the study, they're, they're going to observe the, the different um, extents of that, you know, based on where people fall on those two scales. So we'll leave that there. Now I want to basically move on to my theory about how I feel people can be less well-traveled and how that factors into it. In terms of this idea that I have here about being well-traveled and how that relates to varying scales of prejudice and racism. Um, sorry. Um... <laughs> I haven't found much research out there about it. And that's why I said this this last section is sort of going to be my own hypothesis here. Um, and I haven't done a research study. I haven't done um, a sample population. I haven't looked at outliers. I haven't um, formed an abstract. You know, I haven't performed a research study. And so I cannot I cannot tell you that this is hard evidence of anything. All I can say is that this is my learned experience and something that I've observed myself. And it's just an opinion, you know, until there's more research done into that. It's just that. But um, before I, I get into it, I want to caveat by saying it really hurt me. You know, it, I, I laugh at it because it's funny. <laughs> But at the same time, it, it hurts me to see the sort of crazy, obsessive comments online, you know, about, you know, Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, especially on my videos where I'm, I'm praising their actual admirable um, traits, their humanitarianism, their resilience, you know, the fact that they have been harassed and and harangled by the public and they just are rising like the phoenix out of the ashes you know you cannot say that everybody can do that um the aaron carters the Anne haishes the anthony bourdains of the world um we see that people don't always overcome that the caroline flax of the world people don't always overcome all of that hate and negativity so while I laugh at it because it's funny, like racists are funny. That that's probably why so many of the people that you know comedians that we watch on TV. I was looking at these old uh, Mind Mencia episodes, and I was looking at just how racist it is. I mean, it was hilarious, but he literally founded his career on being so controversial. Dave Chappelle is similar. I don't think that Dave Chappelle is racist. I think that these comedians really see that racism in society and they make a commentary on it. You know, they could be racist, but I, I doubt that it's as cut and dry as saying that. I think that a lot of these comedians basically, um, you know, make a joke of it by, uh, you know, okay. Shakespeare and my dad essentially said that, you know, and my dad has passed now and he was a writer and so... Um, I really give him a lot of credit for 
a lot of the sort of analytical and um, critical thinking skills that I have, especially my mom as well. But um, both my dad and Shakespeare would say that, um, you know, tragedy plus time is comedy. And so we have to laugh at tragedy because if we don't, we as humans don't move forward. That's tragedy is a part of our life. It's like, you know, my husband and I binge watch a bunch of This Is Us yesterday because I, like I told you guys, my mom, she's so up with the technology now because she's retired and she has time. And like, I was telling her few few weeks back, like probably maybe three or four weeks back that I really love this show, This Is Us, that she needs to watch it. She needs to check it out. And then lo and behold, by last week, it's like, she was done. She's like, you, you still not done? I'm like, no, I haven't had time. <laughs> but it's such a good show. Um, but when we watch it, it's one of those shows that, you know, housewives like cry at and, and talk to the TV. Like all oh, yesterday, I was like, dude, why am I talking to the TV? He's like, yeah, babe, like, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. But we, we literally, he's like, why is this show so depressing? And I'm like, because it deals with life, love, loss, um, death, racism, pain. And the people who say, can we just watch something happy? Can we just watch something uplifting? Can we just can we stop talking about racism now? Is everything racist? I think these people are doing themselves a disservice. It's because they're, they're almost numbing themselves to the sad realities of the world. And that breeds complicity and complicity breeds perpetuation. Of these same generational problems, these same generational problems of generational poverty, of generational uneducation and miseducation, um, of classism, of racism, of sexism, um, of destroying our planet. Like, I, I don't want to sound like some left ring nut, you know, just going on and on, but it's true. It's true. And so I think this third hypothesis for me as far, I'm going to go ahead and say it outright. I feel like if you are well-traveled, you basically can't be racist. Now, I, of course, of course there are exceptions to this rule. Of course. But if you're truly, and, and I'm not even going to say well-traveled, because there there can be people who are well-traveled, who are privileged, who are wealthy. You know, they can jet set wherever they want to go and still be racist. I almost want to talk to an exposure an exposure, a, a certain level of true integration into multicultural landscapes. Now, what am I talking about? Like people who um, are immersed into other people from other cultures, other countries, other languages, other backgrounds, other socioeconomic classes through university. And that's a very easy example. You know, you go to university and hopefully, hopefully you go to a university that has a little bit of diversity and you get to experience all of these other cultures, all of these other things. And um, I don't think that that breeds racism. You know, if it, if it does, I feel like there's something generational to look at. You know, are you coming from a family that has a background of racism? Has it been that deeply embedded into you? Um, is there any educational sort of deficiencies because we see that education weighs into this but if you um are immersed in in work groups you know that are inter internationally driven that are multicultural that have people of different places different backgrounds you know all put together um do you have friends very simply put do you have friends that are people from all different backgrounds and i don't mean just like Facebook friends that you sometimes like their posts every once once a year or two, you know, I'm talking about some of your closest friends. Do you make it a precedence to really be friends with people, other people in life who have cultures different than your own? And lastly, do you travel? 
Do you travel outside of your small corner of the world to um, discover that, you know, people do things in different ways than you do. People do different things in the ways that your country might do it. Um, let's go ahead and look at this Mark Twain quote together. So, so Mark Twain says, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. Mark Twain. And that is such a beautiful quote because I find it to be so true. You know, in America, where I'm from, um, especially in Birmingham, Alabama, I mean, that's where I was born. My family moved to Atlanta, Georgia when I was six. And Atlanta, Georgia is much more diverse than Alabama. It's more multicultural, at least the, especially the, the center, because Atlanta is a, is a, a metropolitan hub. You go outside of Atlanta and it's basically like you just right back in the heart of Dixie. But um, compared to my upbringing in Birmingham, I just know I saw people, many more people from other um, cultural groups, we'll say. And I also, it, it seemed that Alabama was just aging in reverse. It just, it was it's almost like a retirement state, you know, it's just... I don't know. There's lots of hicks there. <laughs> there's lots of, um, you know, rednecks and racists and, and white rednecks, black rednecks, all kinds of rednecks. But, you know, not to knock it or anything. Some people just want like a slower lifestyle. Some people don't want glitz and glam. They don't want the city life. You know, some people really just want that country life. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but when ignorance and prejudice, racism, those things factor into it, I think you need to take a look at yourself and, um, I found it more so with, you know, people that, that my family knew or that were friends of the family or old neighbors and things like that from, from Alabama, more so than with when we stayed in Atlanta. I found it seemed more people um, had never, ever left their city or their state. Like they had never, ever left their state. And I know that America is big as heck. So each little state is almost like a country in itself. So I get it, but you seriously never had the desire or anything to leave out of the small corner of the world that you've been in. And the way that Mark Twain says it, you know, vegetating in this little corner of the world, it breeds racism, it breeds bigotry. I get it. I mean, you're, you're just intellectually stunting yourself. Now, that's the difference between there's I feel like there's a difference between being well traveled and, um, you know, proud of it. Or there's a difference between no, 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 let me take that back. There's a difference between not being able to afford to travel. Let's get really real. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. There's a difference between not being able to afford to travel and the desire to to better yourself, to learn more, to travel, you know, like, I feel like there are a lot of people who use this defense of, oh, I can't, I can't afford it. Like, what am I supposed to do? You know, us as humans, and I am not trying to, um, undervalue or belittle anyone's experience with poverty. Like poverty, as my mom says, is B-I-T-C-H. And I get it, but you have to have, you know, the way to break generational poverty, the way to break generations of l lacking in education is to be brave, you know, to be brave and to be curious and to step out on your own. And I feel like it's the same thing with racism and bigotry. You have to be brave to step out of racism and bigotry. Now, um, <sighs> traveling, I feel like there's two things. There's 
you know, immersing yourself in other cultures in your own, in your whole own country, in your own place of, of work in your own, um, educational establishment in your own city and your own states, your own country, whatever. Okay. There's that sort of embracing other cultures, having friends, real friends, you know, that not that like token, <laughs> uh, you know, think of like, I have friends who are black. Like I got this one friend, Dave, we talk at the water cooler every day at work. No, that doesn't count. Like, do you know Dave's backgrounds? Do you know, you know, the kind of like political and socioeconomic, um, you know, um, the things about his passion, what the things that he likes to discuss. Do you know about his family dynamic? Do you know about, um, you know, what his pet peeves are? Do you know how he was raised? Have you talked to him about ways that you were raised differently from the ways that he was raised? Do you guys go out on the weekends to catch a movie? Like, unless you really have friends from other culture in your life that you really are treating as a true friend, not a Facebook friend, not a water cooler friend, but a true friend, I don't think it counts. I really don't. Like, not if that is every instance of a person of another race that you have as a friend. Like, if every person of another race that you have as a friend is a water cooler or Facebook friend and not really a true, you know, real friend that you really, like, experience life together, you guys understand each other's life paths, your journeys, you know, what you're working towards, you support each other. I'm not really saying that it counts. So there's this idea of embracing inclusion where you're at, you know, it's like you're static where you're at, but you're embracing this multicultural landscape around you. And then there's this other thing of you exiting your environment to go see how others live. Have you been to, you know, other countries that are really, um, tribalistic you know have you been to countries if you're if you're from the western world have you been to the eastern world if you're from the eastern world have you been to the western world have you and, and even if you haven't been there yet if you can't afford the trip yet are you working to save up a little slush fund to be able to travel when you want to are you going online and looking at documentaries about other cultures are you reading books about other cultures and traveling um, I really feel like education combined with multicultural immersion, where you're at with friends and things like that, traveling and seeing how other people live. I feel like those are all, you know, total just annihilators of racism and bigotry. So when I look at what's going on in the UK around Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, and I look at what's going on in the U.S., which I'm going to do a video about this soon, too, about how the U.K. and the U.S. are far less similar than they like to admit. You know, they both have these deep um, embedded struggles with racism, and often what I see online is that racists just don't get it. They just don't get it. And I think that education factors in that. But I also think if if you, okay, two examples, and then I'm going to get off of here. So there was one on LBC. I'm going to link that in here. A caller called LBC to say that he was once a racist. His family was racist. It had been encouraged in his family his whole life you know it was a subject of connection for he and his friends you know he would just laugh this is probably a you know this was probably a white guy I I say again quote unquote white because what is white is it Dutch is it Portuguese is it um British is it Italian you know but you know whatever those are the cultural terms that society has just welded out so i guess we'll speak that way but he was a white guy and he was basically talking about um you know how he went to college and that changed everything for him because he started to get exposed 
to other cultures, people from other races, people of the cultures, all these backgrounds coming together. And it really just being immersed in this landscape of multiculturalism just really wiped out any racism that he had left up in there. And at that point, you know, in his life, he started to try and spread that among his community. So his family and his friends, who he would have joked about with racist quips before, you know, now he's saying, hey, stop that. You know, stop that. Don't do that in front of me. I'm not going to tolerate it. You know, that's ignorant. That's bigoted. And sometimes his friends and family, I guess, would have the reaction of saying like, oh, well, you still racist. You, 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 you didn't really change. And he's like, well, yeah, I have. So that right there, again, I feel like points to this, this level. It's not just academic education that um, annihilates racism and bigotry. There's also, I feel like, this cultural immersion that needs to happen where you really um, develop empathy for someone else. Now, the second um, instance that I'm going to leave you with is uh, uh, it's from the, the U.S. And th- this is from the U.K. and the U.S. for a reason, because I feel like the U.K. is a country that I really like culturally. And I watch a lot of British shows and read a lot of British literature. You know, I'm really interested in some of the 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 periods of the monarchy in the past from the from Britain, um, some of their their architecture and art and things like that. And so I see this country that I used to revere so much for its literature, for its sense of class and and tradition that it just seemed like America had forgotten. And I see this debacle with Harry and Meghan and people fighting so, so hard and they don't even know that it's racist. They can't even wrap their head around why this is racist, you know, and then seeing what's happening in the U.S. where all of these white supremacist groups are no longer hiding. (laughs) They're like, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. You know, it's like seeing that, you know, my country of birth and one of the countries that I have since my childhood enjoyed so much art and literature that comes from it, It's really heartbreaking. But again, I told you that analytical part of me also wants to know what can we do to support this? What can we do to remedy this as a society? And where is the problem coming from? So I gave you the example of the guy who called into LBC for the UK. Now for the US, there is a story, and I'm going to link both of these instances below. There's a story that started circulating in the US of a former, I think he was a KKK member, um, a former white supremacist who was is no longer racist, and they had formed a very standing um friendship, a, a a very transformative friendship with a black woman, and you know I don't know that he credits this black woman entirely for wiping out you know that racist bone in his body, but them developing this friendship really turned that around for him. And they, these are not romantic partners or anything. They, they are just friends. And this, you know, just developing a friendship with someone from a different background as his own, wiped that prejudice on out, wiped that racism on out. So I do think that this idea of A, being well-traveled, going out into the world to visit other places and see how they do things, and bringing in this level of inclusion and multiculturalism where you're at in your corner of the world is going to wipe out racism. So I think, you know, as, as we roll along and I make more videos supporting causes like those of Harry and Meghan and people who experience racism, um... When I get these bigots, when you guys creep up in my comments, um, I'm going to start asking you your 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 credentials, okay, in terms of racism, in terms of this, what we 
what we're discussing here today. And that's not just going to be your academic credentials. I'm going to ask you about uh, the level of multiculturalism and inclusion that you have in your life. And Lord have mercy, if you guys say I have a black friend named Dave, we talk at the water cooler every day, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> But um, guys, let me know what you think in the comments. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I know it was a bit of a long one. Um, if you found some things in this video that were interesting to you, please put them in the comments. Um, if you have any questions, any ideas, um, any concepts, we can do another video like this. We can even do a live stream where we can chat and talk about it. So let me know what you guys are responding to. And I'll see you in the next one. By the way, if you haven't already, please go ahead and click that like and subscribe button and I'll talk to you later. Okay.